questions that we're not addressing. Uh, you know, the important questions that we're simply, you know, sidelining every day, you know, like in our blind pursuit of something we don't really understand. So in this presentation, I want to make a confession. I'm going to take some shortcuts. I'm going to try and be funny. I hope I'm going to make you laugh a little bit because uh, um, I don't want this to be an uninspiring conversation about a worst case scenario. And um, I'm glad I'm always a bit embarrassed when they read my bio because uh, I really believe that you can have intelligent ideas without having titles and you can have stupid ideas with lots of titles. <laughs> But since people pay attention to titles, you know, like it, it actually helps me then say that whatever you heard is true and whatever I'm saying is based on facts and science, actually very good science. It may sound funny, it may sound hilarious at times, but behind everything I say there is robust science and if during the Q&A you want me to expand on some of the things that I'm going to say, please, you know, make it clear and I'll be happy to engage. But because I don't want you to fall asleep after having driven through this beautiful traffic of Vintook all the way here, I'm going to try and take some shortcuts and be a bit light in, in this presentation. So um, I was telling um, our hosts that um, it's very nice to be back in Namibia. I was here, I've been here a few times as a tourist, but on an official visit four years ago, invited by the Namibian Statistics Agency. I gave a few talks uh, to um, a number of statisticians back then about gross domestic problem, by the way, you know, the book that made me famous. Um, great title. I still think it's a nice title, you know, like, and we should all try and rename it, uh, you know, rename it as gross domestic problem and then you will see that people will not pay too much attention to it anymore. But, um, and then in the evening I gave a talk to a Pratia hotel and there was a big audience like this in, and I remember that as uh, the former statistician general, uh, Dr. John Stadler, was introducing me, um, all of a sudden there was noise in the room. And, and then somebody whispers in John's ear and I see John is blushing and kind of becoming nervous. And I thought, my God, the CIA must have found us. <laughs> and actually says, um, ladies and gentlemen, there is a slight change in program. I've just been told that um, Mr. Helge Gengob is arriving and he wants to listen to this conversation. And I was really, back then he was the Prime Minister, and I was really humble, I mean I didn't really know exactly who he was, but somebody told me he's important. And, and then this, this, man, this man came and sat in the front row and started taking notes as I was talking. It's never happened to me that a politician took notes. It was beautiful to see that you have a politician who can read and write, and, and, <laughs> and, and that actually that was interested, was interested in these issues. I mean, I was really, really happy. And then somebody said to me, that man is going to be our next president. So I'm not sure, I don't know whether he's going to come today. Um, I'm a, we're probably going to hear the helicopters and the sirens if that's the case, but, um, but I'm, I, feel, I feel positive that having at least somebody in a position of power that pays some attention to these issues is crucial. It is crucial. Um, as, um, as the Dean mentioned earlier, for the past years I've been talking about these issues and you know, very few people paid attention at the beginning, right? So especially in my country, South Africa. Uh, by the way, I, mean, I have to seek exile in, 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 in Namibia because uh, I'm, I'm making a lot of enemies back home. And, uh, <laughs> One, one day I'll be, I'll be heralded as a hero, but at present I think, you know, like uh, people are very happy with what I have to say because I just simply speak the truth. So years ago, I started talking about the problem with the way in which we understand growth. You know, and people, people saw it as a problem, saw it as, a, saw it as, a, as a, something that they couldn't understand because they thought, well, growth means a better life, right? You know, if I talk to anybody, so like, you know, what do you think growth is? Everybody says, well, growth is a better life. It's going to be more money, more better quality of life. It's going to be, you know, stuff that I need. And that's the problem, because growth doesn't necessarily mean that. And actually, more and more, it means the opposite. And, and of course, if you're selling it as improving your life, how can you be against it? So my job has been back then to try and show the science behind the critique of growth and realize that there could be many different approaches to growth. The one we have chosen is very short-sighted, is very myopic, anachronistic, obsolete. I came up with all these sort of adjectives until 
I realized that maybe there was a there was a there was a better uh, better term, a more technical term to describe growth, and that growth is simply stupid, and and I think now we're coming to terms with that. Um, and so, you know, when people ask me, like, uh, how, you know, how, what is the science behind it? You know, how, you know, how, why do you say that? I started, I started arguing that, that you will see that things will get worse and worse in our country, at least in South Africa, and that you will see that every year since 2012, when I started doing my own growth estimates for the country. So imagine me in my little office with a laptop calculating the GDP for next year and saying next year is going to be this amount of this amount, and the Reserve Bank with lots of economists and big computers and lots of money and Merck's parked in the parking lot. They were doing the same job every single year. They overestimated our GDP projections every single year. And my, proje my projections were much closer to the reality than theirs. And, and then people started calling me. And they said, how is it possible that three years in a row you projected growth at a level which was more accurate than the people were in charge of our projections? You know, what information do you have? that we don't have? And my answer was, you know, you didn't observe the facts. You pretended things would always be better. Every year you said to the people, don't worry, it's a bit, ter it's a bit bad this time, but it's going to be better next time. And you know, what, you, know what, you know what that does? That makes you not really try to change and innovate because you think, you know what, okay, we're going to go through 12 months of hardship, but next year it's going to be better anyway. There's no reason to transform. There's no reason to change. So year after year, I've done this. And initially, people really called me names. They were upset. You know, um, I have a column, a, a column in the Business Day, which is South Africa's prime financial newspaper. Um, I cannot tell you the comments. They said, Professor Fioramonti is a communist. Professor Fioramonti is a capitalist. Professor Fioramonti is in bed with environmentalists. Professor Fioramonti is in bed with the military. Professor Fioramonti is a foreigner, is against the revolution, is in bed with the CIA. I was in bed with so many people that my wife started wondering what was wrong with me. <laughs> and, and, you know, the truth was just that I was trying to tell, you know, it, truth is a big word, but I was using science to explain that that model was so short-sighted and myopic. It was so stupid, as I said. Um, and why is it stupid? Why is it so short-sighted? Because growth doesn't really take into account what we need as a society to thrive. You know, the, our approach to growth says that if I keep my trees intact, if I protect my ecosystems, is this still working? There you go. Then, you know, like the CIA, I'm telling you. <laughs> but can you hear me there at the back? All right, I'll try anyway, so old-fashioned. You know, I don't have PowerPoint, I don't have a mic, you know, like so. Um, so our growth model says that if um, I keep our ecosystems intact, I protect the trees, I grow trees, that doesn't really count as part of the wealth of a, of a nation. The only way for trees to matter as wealth is by chopping them and selling them. That if I you know, keep my water sources intact and clean, well, they don't really count as part of our wealth. But if I pollute them and I need to clean them up and I need to invest money into restoring them, then all of a sudden that's growth. If I keep my people healthy, that doesn't really count as part of our development, as part of a healthy economy. But if they get sick, then of course that adds to growth. And the sicker, the better actually. Um, you know, like we have this, uh, um, Klaus was introducing us to the beauties of growth, you know, traffic accidents. Every time, every time you get stuck in traffic is a great thing. Actually, we have this metaphor that I use to my students. You imagine the perfect growth person, the perfect growth man, is an obese driver stuck on a highway eating a hamburger because he's having a, a cardiovascular disease and actually a diabetes, and he's on the phone speaking to his lawyer who was overseeing his divorce and while he does that, he's getting into a traffic accident and probably he dies. All these things add to our growth. Every time people die, you have funerals, insurances pay out, and, and so on and so forth. Every time people get sick, there is an entire economy that gets activated. Now the question is, is that a sign 
Because that's what we think when we think of growth. That an economy that grows faster than another one, it's a better economy. That an economy that grows faster than another one is a better performing one. That it's a more desirable economy. But if our economies also consider as part of growth all these negative effects, is this really development? And you may say, oh, come on, but these are all marginal figures. That's not true at all. Let me give you an example. Okay, let's move away from Africa for a second and let's go to the you know, like to the uh, leader of the free world, uh, Trump land, the America, right? So 20% of the American economy, 20%, not 2%, 20% of the American economy is health care, right? So um, the America's growth miracle is due to three main factors. Finance, and we know them, the Wall Street guys that destroyed the world in 2008. Second, health care. Third, military expenses. So most of the growth is due to these three factors. So I don't want to talk about finance. I think we could have an entire conversation about how you know, like useful and how, you know, how dangerous that is in some cases. But certainly, 20% of medical, of healthcare expenses are an enormous amount. And it's not that Americans are living long lives. It's not that Americans, because of that, have a, a better life expectancy. Actually, they have one of the worst life expectancies in the developed world. But be, exactly because they get sick so easily, they, poor so, they, they eat so poorly, because they have a very stressed lifestyle, they have one of the highest levels of obesity and malnutrition in the world, that is a manna for growth, because they're continuously spending money on medicines, expe expensive treatment, and so on and so forth. Although we all know that even their public health care system is in shambles, it's terrible, right? So when I was in Costa Rica last year, I met with the president of Costa Rica, a tiny little country. I don't know if you've ever seen it on the map. It's actually right there where nobody is ever paying attention, you know, that part of the world that nobody cares about. So Costa Rica is 4.5 million people. They have the highest life expectancy of the entire American continent, even higher than Canada. They have public education, which is extremely efficient. And above all, they have an approach called public health. You know what they do? Rather than spending a lot of money on treating people, they make sure that the entire economy is designed so that people eat well, do not stress, so stress as little as possible, and prevent diseases so that they do not get sick. It's not Mr. Gango, right? <laughs> so I just, you, you just tell me, just in case, you know? Like. So what happens? So the president of Costa Rica comes to me and says, Professor Fioramonti, you talk a lot about growth. Just explain to me something. How is it possible that my country has the best health profile in the entire continent? But because we keep people healthy, we spend so much less money, and this doesn't translate into growth, and I get punished for that. I'm considered underdeveloped. I'm considered in a recession or in, in stress. And why? When I look at America, they get celebrated as this economic miracle, this extremely successful economy, when they build most of their growth on getting people sick in the first place. Is that okay? Is that, is that reasonable? And I had no answer for him. I had no way to explain why is that the case. Now let's move back to our countries. You know what is the largest economic sector in South Africa today? Exactly. Private security is the largest economic sector in South Africa. So we have to thank crime and fear of each other if our economy is still growing a little bit. Because all the money we spend on our security gates, electric fences, private guards, you name it, is adding a lot to our economic growth. Now, we are in a recession, so overall things are getting worse from, for growth. But still a big chunk of that is due to a problem. Rather than an indicator of better a better economic performance, this model thrives out of fear, lack of social cohesion, rampant crime, and high inequality, right? So, and we have done research and published it a few years ago, in which we show that most of the growth that has happened globally since the late 1970s is actually, most of it is actually due to things that we don't really want. It's due to increasing stresses and inequality. It's due to conflict and wars. It's due to, um, uh, as I said, you know, like divorces and other problems. And above all, it's due to environmental destruction. So when you buy bottled water because you're 
you know, your tap water is being contaminated, that's consumption, that adds to GDP, but you would rather drink the water from the tap if it hadn't been contaminated in the first place, right? So it's a vicious circle. And it's adding more and more. Most of our economies are now producing what economists call negative externalities, more than the positive, the positive ones. And, and this is becoming a trend all over the world, but it's just extremely severe in Africa. So as one of my predictions, a few besides you know, like fighting with the Reserve Bank of South Africa over GDP estimates, um, I also started saying, okay, you know, I have a column in the journal. I'm gonna start you know, coming up with predictions. And I said, back in 2013, I said, be careful about Nigeria. Soon it will become the largest economy in this continent, but it's gonna be one of the worst disasters. Ah, again, you know, prophet of doom, all these things, so much so that Business Day had to stop, had to stop the commentary on my articles. They said, for these articles, you're not allowed to comment anymore because just there was too much personal offense. Uh, this is 2013. In 2014, I don't know if you remember here in Namibia, but in 2014, Nigeria became the continent's largest economy because it rebased its GDP, right? I had already said that a year before. And people said to me, like, how come you knew already? And again, the answer is that, how don't you know? I mean, it was already on the cards. And when that happened, that Nigeria became the largest economy on the continent, South Africans who had been beaten at the growth game were in, na in national mourning. They were all, you know, like as if that was a national funeral. More sh tears were shed that day than the day that Nelson Mandela died. Okay. <laughs> And, and you know, remember, remember the semifinal of the World Cup in Brazil, when Brazil played against Germany, and Germany scored like five goals in 20 minutes? That was exactly South Africa, what happened in South Africa. <laughs> so our policymakers were walking around like this, you know, they were terribly destroyed, like, okay, we lost the game. Now the Nigerians are gonna be the favorite rising stars in Africa, and so on and so forth. And I said to them, don't worry, give Nigeria a couple of years, you will see what happens. And that's exactly what happened. Then I started saying, you know what, once I published an article and I said, you know what, in a year time we're going to have the worst water crisis that we can remember of. And this is going to be really, really impacting negatively our economy. Again, communist, fascist, all of that. Um, and then this was in April, just a few months later, South Africa had the worst water crisis that in living memory. And again, I got interviewed by newspapers asking me the usual questions. How did you know? How is it possible that you knew and the others didn't? And the answer was always the same. Everybody should have known the data was right there. We just decided not to, not to read it, not to look at it. And, 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 um, and then the drought. We never considered the environmental impacts of our production systems. The drought has been to the South and African economies the worst economic crisis we've ever had. The, drought, the economic impact of the drought has exceeded the economic impact of the other financial crisis we have seen so far. So when modern nature gets upset with us, it really has a negative impact in our pockets and our bank accounts. So I'm telling you, even if we don't care about the environment, as good economists, we need to, because that will have a huge impact on our resources. So, and, and so I started talking about, you know, like, What's going to happen when my publisher, the publisher of this book, Well Being Economy, last year tells me, okay, Lorenzo, we accept your crazy ideas. Hopefully nobody's going to take us to court when you do that. And I said to them, don't worry. It's going to be a big sale. Don't worry. And they said, okay, the book is going to come out in June 2017. And then I did my calculation and I said, and I said okay, by June 2017, the country will be in a recession. It's going to be a boom. It's going to be a great thing for the book. Everybody will want to read the book because it had already been predicted. The book came out on the 1st of June, 2017. By the 3rd of June, 2017, our stats say Statistics South Africa announced the country was in a technical recession. So again, things were already happening. We just decided not to see them. And so the book, what does the book do? The book simply says, guys, let's make peace with the reality. Our growth model is stupid, right? We can do better than that. We can actually create all the things we think growth can give us even at times of low growth. And perhaps, and here is when economists you know, pass out and start leaving the room, perhaps we can do better because growth is no longer an option and we can optimize the resources we have. And I call this the well-being economy. So what is the well-being economy? The well-being economy is exactly the opposite of the growth economy. The growth economy says, 
that we can prosper as an economy by expanding ourselves, our transactions, our consumption as much as possible and by basically destroying our natural ecosystems and weakening our social ties. We don't really need that. The economy grows at the expense of nature and at the expense of society. The well-being economy does exactly the opposite. It recognizes that there is no way you can have a thriving economy without healthy ecosystems and strong and thriving societies. Without trust, without social cohesion, you grow the economy at the expense of the economy itself. You do what Nigeria has done. Nigeria has grown the economy at the expense of the pillars that were keeping the economy intact. And when the pillars came down, the economy itself collapsed. It's a bit like the iceberg. Growth is the top, but it's sustained by things at the bottom. We don't see, also because our statisticians do not measure the things that really matter, not because they don't want to, because you know, they don't have the money and they have a different mandate. But what is below is so much important. When that goes, the iceberg also um, uh, drowns, you know, like goes underwater. So the well-being economy does exactly the same, and that's exactly the opposite. And asks the question, can we create jobs by looking at the environment as a strong economic resource? Can we create jobs by looking at society, not as something that needs to be there and we need to support it, but as a resource for economic development as well? And this also really means rethinking what we mean by jobs. It means rethinking what we mean by investment, by what we mean by infrastructure. In South Africa, we have this dream with this obsession with big things. So as soon as we've got some money, we build highways. And then you know one thing we do better than anybody else. We build shopping malls every 200 meters. Uh, you can go from one shopping mall to the other one by flying you know, on a kite you know, in South Africa. If you, draw, if, you, if you parachute yourself from the sky, you will probably land on a shopping mall in South Africa. <laughs> okay, so we do that because we think, hey, you know, growth means big. Growth means big infrastructure, you know, big, big compounds, energy conglomerates, and so on and so forth. Well-being does exactly the opposite. It recognizes, for instance, that nature already gives us for free a lot of valuable infrastructure. Science tells us that wetlands are better at purifying water than most of our built infrastructure. So rather than destroying it and replacing it with concrete, why don't we invest and create jobs out of maintaining it and actually sustaining it? Uh, we lose in South Africa, I don't know in Namibia, I don't have data about Namibia, but I'm sure you know, South Africa and Namibia are not that far apart in many negative things, unfortunately. <laughs> Um, we lose 50% of our potential GDP, of potential value, the equivalent of GDP, in soil degradation, in land degradation. We've been mining our way to the point that actually we're sitting with land that can no longer be used to produce food, and at least not at the level that we could have done before uh, this obsession with mining. And the United Nations, for instance, has done some interesting research globally to show something that the growth economy doesn't want us to recognize. And that is that some of the most lucrative for growth, lucrative activities in the world create such a damage to natural systems that if we were to ask the companies that make money out of those processes simply to pay the bill, they wouldn't have enough money to pay the bill. They don't make enough money to pay the bill of what they destroy. In the book I say that growth is a little bit like when, I, when my kids decide to wash the car. I'm sure that all parents know what happens. When kids say, Dad, I'll be washing the car, don't worry. They make a mess, scratch the car, and you know, like then until it's gonna, I'm gonna spend two days just to get it back to where it was and a lot of money. And on top of that, they expect to be paid. They said, where, where am I ran now I've done, my, I've done my chores? And I mean, in a sense, a lot of industrial production is the same. They create a lot of damage, create a lot of negative consequences that we all have to pay for through our tax. And then they consider themselves creators of value. They go out there to say, you see how good I am. I've generated growth for this country. So the UN says, be careful. The United Nations, okay? This is not Greenpeace, the Catholic Church, or WWF. It's the United Nations. They say, be careful. Because when you're measuring the natural impacts of some of these activities, you realize that most of these companies are taking away wealth rather than adding wealth. This is extremely important. They're taking wealth away. That wealth was already there. They're taking it away privatize it into private profits, and I've got nothing against private profits, I think it's good, but can you give me the river back the way it was while you're creating those profits? Because I don't want to have a loss 
It's my loss and your gain. That's not good market economy. That's called, you know, fraud. So the UN says that all the energy mining, the biggest energy, fossil fuel energy, and mining corporations, as well as commercial food production, the 20 largest industrial sectors in the world, are actually accumulating a debt to society at large rather than generating real profits for us as, global, as a global economy. So what happens in the well-being economy? It is, it's exactly the opposite. You invest in businesses that create value by adding to what we already have, by minimizing environmental impacts. When environmental impacts have to happen, they make sure that they generate so much value that whatever value is being created can restore what was damaged. So important. In South Africa, now we're sitting with mining um, sites that have been abandoned. Lots of people that are sick and, in and jobs that are being lost because mining companies are moving further afield and we're sitting with the problem. And, and this is not the miracle we thought mining could bring to our country, right? And I'm just indicating to you, be careful. I'm not saying do not mine, but before you mine, make sure you do your accounting correctly because you may end up worse off than before. And then you know what, while I was giving these talks, one day a guy comes to me and says, hey, would you like to come and visit my mining company? I said like, are you sure? Is it, have you heard what I just said? I don't think we're gonna be friendly with one another. And he says to me, no, 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 I wanna show you something. So I fly to Belgium and I go and visit one of the largest mining companies in the world, Umicore. This company operated for 30 years in the Congo. You know, when I say the Congo, I mean, that's real Africa. That's like bad, you know, tough one, right? And these guys were not good guys. They were doing the nasty things that Belgian colonization has done to Africa. So they were bad, bad people. At some point, they realized two things. That they couldn't justify to a lot of good people back in Belgium what they were doing. And then they had a CEO who realized that there was much more money to be made, not out of mining the ground, but mining this. There is more gold, platinum, rare earths in the stuff we have in our pockets these days. And we throw away, on average, smartphones are thrown away every six months in the world. We throw this away, put it in the landfill, and keep drilling holes to find what is already here. In South Africa, in a ton of soil, there is uh, four grams, on average, four grams of gold. In this phone, there is more than 25 grams of gold. So they said, you know what, why are we drilling, why are we digging holes? Let's mine what is already out there. We're gonna recycle the metals and we're gonna make lots of money. That's well-being economy. It's realizing that you don't have to make money at the expense of society. You can make money in ways. Maybe you're gonna make less money perhaps in some cases, but that less money will be quality money, will be money that is really added value. You're creating profit without destroying the things that allow you to continue creating profit. It's a non-societal strategy. And so I started talking about well-being economy even in South Africa and many more people came to me and I said like, you know, can you give us a talk? Can you also do it? You know, like many more businesses came on board because they realized that it wasn't an anti-business conversation. It wasn't an anti-business manifesto. It was a better business manifesto. It was about moving away from destructive business and rewarding the good businesses. And above all, the small and medium and micro enterprises that we have considered inferior uh, backward and so on and so forth. The real creators of wealth in our countries are those people out there, are the artisans, the carpenters, the plumbers, those that try to do something notwithstanding our obsession with shopping malls, highways, big financial industries and so on and so forth. Because their impact, negative impacts of those small businesses is so small and the positive impact is so high. They hire a lot of people, they hire local workforce, they're creating livelihoods for our communities and you cannot sustain any form of economic development without healthy communities. That's where the emphasis of government, I'm looking at some people perhaps involved in government activities here, government, the only thing that government can do well is to try and ask one question, how do we build thriving communities? That is the fundamental pillar of our economy. Do not obsess with subsidizing mining companies. Ask yourself, how do we empower communities? How do we create opportunities for these people who sit unemployed because we have made them unemployed? How do we create an opportunity for them to create new jobs, to become entrepreneurs for themselves, small business owners, and so on and so forth? 
And so, um, and so the well-being economy is really a positive, a positive message, especially a positive message for African countries. My sense is that the growth we have seen in the past few years will never come back. Okay, don't tell the president. You know, yesterday, yesterday the statistician general showed me on his app, a beautiful app that they have created, this sudden drop in GDP from 6.1% to 0. Point something this the last year. I mean, it must have been a cold shower. I'm telling you, that kind of drop is a bit dodgy to me. I don't, I've, even, oh, even though I'm critical of GDP, I've never seen some, such a thing before in my life. <laughs> but the long term, in our lifetime, growth will be much lower than we imagine. The International Monetary Fund has come back with the, the hypothesis of a secular stagnation. Perhaps the whole of the 21st century will be low growth. So the question becomes, can we do better? Can we do well? Can we build success in times of low growth? And I, my answer is yes. Yes, because the fact that growth is out of the way makes us more innovative, makes us able to say, okay, how are we gonna now focus on the things that really matter? If growth is no longer gonna be able to take us there, how do we go there in different ways? And perhaps by dealing with some of the problems directly. And, um, and the beautiful thing is that the well-being economy really moves our attention from the things that don't matter to the things that really matter. Questions that we have been avoiding for so long and now we can no longer avoid. And these include how we do, how we redistribute the wealth that we already have in a way which is smart and intelligent. Some of the research we have done shows that rich people in countries that are very unequal have, a high, have, a, have more of an interest, should have more of an interest in redistribution than poor people because their quality of life will increase much more than the poor. Because some of the main issues, some of the main restrictions and negative impacts that they suffer in our countries, from crime to violence to having to protect themselves all the time, will become so less prevalent that their quality of life will increase. And there is beautiful research that has been, show, that has been done that shows that a rich person in a more equal society lives longer than a rich person in a less equal society. So it's also self-destructive for rich people to simply want to in, you know, like perpetrate that level of inequality. But of course I believe, and I talk to a lot of rich people around, that them, they want to know that whatever is going to be done with the money that they have generated will really be used to reduce poverty and to decrease inequality rather than being spent on vanity projects as we do so well in South Africa. But the good thing is that our president already has a big home, so hopefully he's not going to need another one. <laughs> So, and, and so the well-being economy, by shifting that attention, really makes many other things possible. So one day I got invited again to speak on radio, and it's, it was one of those uh, two-minute interview in which they said, in two minutes, maybe one and a half, you have to explain to us why growth is wrong, what is the alternative, uh, how are you going to measure it, and what would you do if you were the Minister of Finance in the next ten years, in one and a half minutes. So I said, you know what, I'm going to just tell you something. One thing, the reason why growth is a problem is that growth is like sex. And everybody immediately paid attention. <laughs> growth is like sex. The more you obsess about it, the worse you get at it. So if you want to achieve growth, think about something else. Think about promoting well-being. Think about creating the jobs you want. Think about building the thriving economies and the thriving local communities that we have been talking about. And you know what that's going to happen? you will have growth again. But this time it's going to be good growth. It's going to be quality growth. It's going to be growth that is really out of adding the value that we consider precious rather than simply mixing up accidents and sick people with better education and better and better lifestyles. Growth puts everything together and, and tells us that the more, more is better. We say better is better. We can do, you know, like we should have an economy that does better and better, that invests in reusing, recycling, not throwing away what can be used and fixed, creating jobs out of circular economic processes. The many jobs that can be created out of recycling and reusing, out of taking care of each other are enormous. We could actually have almost everybody employed in these industries. The other problem is that the growth economy in the age of robots is gonna mean basically full unemployment. Let's face it. If our obsession is, if our development means production, 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 
Why should I employ you guys when I can have robots that do it, A, for free, they don't drink, they don't smoke, they don't go on strike, they don't, you know, like they don't raise objections and they don't join trade unions. Why should I do it? So if our, if our goal is to generate a kind of production growth, robots will do better than humans. But if our job is to create well-being, that's a different story. If our job is to provide to you the service you need and to you the service you need, I need to be a human to distinguish that. Mass production can be done by robots. Customization, local economic production can only be done by people with people. And that is the secret of success in the well-being economy. Bring it down. Make sure that what can be produced locally is produced locally, not in China. Because in China, they also are thinking about starting to produce locally for themselves as much as possible because they're sick and tired of having to wear masks to go to school. And they believe that their miracle, the Chinese miracle, has come with such a great cost. And when I interviewed the then Deputy Minister of the Environment in China, he told me something that very few people know, but it's really so honest. He said to me, I've done my homework calculations. And I can tell you that if China has to fix all the damage generated by 30 years of high growth, in terms of social inequality, China is now one of the most unequal societies in the world. It's a communist country that has a Gini coefficient almost as high as Namibia. He's, com he's competing with you guys. I think, I think you, know, like you have to do something you know, like to make sure China doesn't become more unequal than Namibia. So these, he says to me, if we were to spend money to fix our environment and fix our society, we would need more money than all the growth we have generated since Deng Xiaoping at the end of the 1970s decided that we were to turn into a market economy. So it's just that it's a bit like debt. You know, like growth is also not just like sex, it's also like debt. You know, you go to a bank and you take money and you feel rich. The first half an hour you go around, you buy a car, you buy some booze, you go out with a girl or you go out with a guy, depending what you're you know, sexual taste is. And these days you have to be very, very um, <laughs> considering all possible options. And then you feel rich until the bank calls you back and says, uh, you have to pay the money back, guy. So you, you, you thought that was for free? You know, economists say there's nothing, there's no free lunch, right? The Economic Association of Namibia, no free lunch. So that means that one way or another, we're going to have to pay this money back to Mother Nature, or we're going to have to, re you know, return the money. Like in a sense, take care of our, take care of the debt, deal with the debt. So rather than rather than taking as much money as possible, take the money for what you need and use it very carefully and responsibly. That's what a government should be doing. That's what a business should be doing. It should be about balancing, optimizing the resources rather than maximizing, maximizing consumption. And to conclude, because I see some people are falling asleep and I just don't, one thing I hate is that people fall asleep when I talk because they feel I'm short selling them. You know, like you came here and I don't want you to fall asleep. Namibia is at the crossroads. That picture that the statistician general showed me yesterday was scary, but I think it's going to become the new normal. I'm sorry. It's happening all over the world. Um, growth is gone. Now, we can stay here and cry for as long as we can and cry forever, and, you know, or we can roll up our sleeves and say, can we build success without growth? Uh, what I've said shows that maybe growth was never that desirable, but even if you disagree with me, the reality is that it may have gone for good. So the question is, can we, we're going to have less money perhaps, but can we use that money better? Can we engage communities in co-production of goods and services to make sure that the local economies are going to succeed? Can we invest and create a condition for local small businesses to thrive? And that goes via also making big corporations and big production responsible for the damage. For as long as the big produ producers will be subsidized through our taxpayers' money and all the damages that they generate will be covered by us, there's no way a small business, small business can compete and thrive. We gave the big guys all the advantages and the small guys none of the advantages. And that is not fair. At my university, if I want to register a local taxi driver, I'm going to have a hard time. But if I'm willing to register one of the big taxi companies, it's a deal. It's easy to do that. Why? We should help the small taxi drivers to do transportation. If I want, as I've tried, if I want to have local producers of food to come and sell food on campus, I can't. But we've got plenty of McDonald's, of Steers, and so on and so forth on our campus. We give money to the big industries, and we do not support the small producers of food. 
the small artisan, uh, you know, like artisans and small and medium enterprises. So unless we level that playing field, we're never going to be able to get out of this impasse. So Namibia is at the crossroads. It can cry forever and hope that growth at some point will come back. And you know, by dreaming that the future is just consumption and consumption and consumption and inequality and inequality and inequality and destruction and destruction and destruction, just like the United States of America has taught us that that's the way to go, so that we can follow the same trajectory and then have Donald Trump as a president one day when we complete this process. Because that's, isn't, isn't that the ultimate objective? I mean, that's the pinnacle of development, right? So we're going to go through all these issues, colonization, two world wars, and so on and so forth. And then as a reward, here you have him. Donald Trump is your president. Or we can find a better way. We can say, you know what? Maybe as Africans, we can leapfrog to a new development model. Maybe the fact that we don't have that infrastructure you guys have got in the north that we thought was a problem, Maybe now it's an advantage because we can build the infrastructure of the future rather than having the infrastructure of the past. And, and we can get together and come together with ideas. And we can start from these universities to my colleagues. We have to start teaching our students the real stuff, not what is in textbooks, not the fake stuff, not what has been developed elsewhere, but the real stuff. Otherwise, you know, like, otherwise our students, you know, what, what kills me, what breaks my heart is that my best students Okay, in statistics, um, uh, mathematical economics, and so on and so forth, my best students dream of becoming, not Nobel Prize winners, scientists, they dream of becoming investment bankers. What have I done? I look at myself in the mirror and I feel like maybe I should commit suicide. I'm responsible for this. And you know why they dream of becoming investment bankers? Because that's what society says. The investment banker is the guy that makes the big bucks. It's the most remunerative uh, profession in the world. These are the best skilled people in the world. So then I tell them, you know, the University of Sussex in the UK in 2013 ran a beautiful experiment, which I think should be on page one of all the economics textbooks. So they, they, brought, they put a bunch of investment bankers in the UK. Okay, these are the guys that run the global economy. And, and they gave them 4,000 pounds, assimilation, nominal pounds. They said, you guys use your knowledge, invest these pounds in the stock, in the stock market. And in a week, let's see how much nominal money you will have generated by basing it on your investment skills. Okay. Then in a separate room, they put a cat. Yeah, yeah, you heard C-A-T, a cat. A ginger cat called Orlando. Great name. So this cat had a toy. And one of, one of the experimenters would sit with the cat, have a list of stocks. He would read out the name of the stocks one by one. If the cat dropped the toy, he would disinvest from that stock. If the cat kept the toy in his mouth, he would say, let's invest in this. After a week, who made more money? The cat, 500 pounds more than the investment bankers. Okay, so Orlando beat the investment bankers. You can Google it if you don't believe me. Google always says the truth, right? So Google it. Um, so this is something well known in economic theory. It's called the random walk theory. And that says that a lot of the professions that we believe are highly skilled and competence-based are basically random. They're simply random choices that we have associate with a lot of skills, but that is not the case. But our, our economic students do not, do not get exposed to this. So they really believe in coming to being socialized that that is really when you're so smart and smart, that's how you can create value for society. Now the question is, do you think, now some people may say, well, okay, but you know, you do the experiment another time and investment bankers will probably do better than a cat. Yes, maybe. But imagine I run this experiment and I put a nurse with a sick person in one room and in the other person, a sick person and a cat. And I say, I come back in a week, let's see who has done better. Do you think there would be one chance in the world that the cat does better than the nurse? Imagine I put a gardener in one room and I say, you, cut, you take care of my garden. And in the other room, there is a cat taking care of my garden. Do you think there is one chance that the cat can do better than the gardener? No. That means that some of our ideas about skills and jobs that really matter and the professions that make a difference are so wrong. And we should start, we should really go back to the basics and realize that an economy which is healthy and thriving has to invest in those jobs more, has to make sure that we're going to have highly qualified artisans, we're going to have good gardeners and nurses and teachers and less, and I'm sorry, fewer CEOs and fewer investment bankers and so on and so forth, and probably fewer lawyers as well, you know. 
So Namibia can try and do that. As I said, there is no alternative in my view. It's either the well-being economy or no economy at all. And I really hope that this beautiful country, endowed with some of the most amazing wealth naturally, in the natural field, in the social field, the amazing people that live in this country will not be bamboozled by this ideology which is losing traction all over the world and will be able to actually innovate out of its own ideals, out of its own principles and become also a beacon of innovation for the rest of this beautiful continent. Thank you.